Released by Falcom in the year 2004 on the PC, and later ported to the PlayStation Portable, The Legend of Heroes Trails in the Sky would be the first chapter of a story so large it had to be split into three games during development. Directed by Toshihiro Kondo, who would eventually become the president of Falcom, the game is the first part of a trilogy of games that altogether form the sixth installment in the Legend of Heroes series, which was formed from the spin-off sixth game, Dragon Slayer Legend of Heroes of the Dragon Slayer series, of which Dragon Slayer is credited as the game that created the action genre RPG in 1984. For combat, the game utilizes standard turn-based mechanics on an isometric grid where characters can move, attack, and use special attacks called crafts or cast spells called arts on their turn alongside random bonuses that can trigger on their own. The art system is a deep fusion system of combining elements for each character in order to unlock access to and synthesize a wider pool of elemental spells and effects. Each character has their own set of special attacks and ultimate attacks, though turn initiative is impacted based on turn cooldowns and status effects. The game features a large world to scale with the characters at all times with an isometric perspective of the 3D models, and monsters are encountered on the field instead of being random. Additionally, there is a cooking system to add more depth to the setup-heavy and text-heavy nature of the game. For story, the game features a dual protagonist, Estelle and Joshua, at all times, and are joined by six other party members over the course of the story, though only four are ever fielded in combat at a time. The story only gets larger from here, so let's cut it down to size with the recapitation. The game begins in the Kingdom of Liberal on the continent of Zemuria, where we meet a young girl named Estelle, and her father Cassius brings home a wounded boy one night. The boy is defiantly angry at Cassius, but Estelle's imposing nature manages to quell him. Calming down, the boy introduces himself as Joshua, and as time passes, Cassius has adopted Joshua into his family, as both kids grow under the tutelage of Cassius. As Estelle and Joshua are now 16 years of age, the day has come when they finish up their training at the local guild and take the test into becoming bracers like their father. Their trainer is a woman named Sherazard, who briefly recaps the history of Liberal, in so much that 10 years ago the kingdom was invaded by the Erebonian Empire, but Liberal's advanced and prolific orbment technology allowed them to successfully defend and maintain their independence. Bracers themselves are recognized investigative and combat specialists who help their local regions maintain peace and stability through services from simple odd jobs to monster extermination. The practical exam involves a simulated job posting and completion, and when successfully completed they earn their appointment as junior bracers. Shara congratulates them, mentioning how she remembers when Estelle's father Cassius trained her as a junior bracer years ago, though Estelle seems aloof to why her father has earned such esteem from renowned bracers like Shara. At dinner that night, Cassius receives a letter that demands he leaves for business immediately, and they see him off. He leaves them a few unfinished jobs initially assigned to him, and so Estelle and Joshua launch their formal careers as junior bracers. In one task of monster extermination, Estelle learns Joshua is quite popular with the ladies, but never dates any of them, while Joshua notices his instincts leave him more cutthroat than he likes to admit. The next job involves delivering a rare specimen of Septium for the town mayor, and upon completion, they meet a transfer student of a nearby boarding school named Josette. The package is actually a present for the queen for her upcoming 60th birthday, as appreciation for her post-war leadership. The last task involves escorting a couple of reporters doing a story on one of the strange towers nearby. As it turns out, nearby regions have their own similar towers, all built long ago when the world was founded, yet all strangely abandoned. On the roof, they find a strange ancient device, as well as an archaeologist named Professor Alba, who is studying these ruins, though they find it awfully suspicious that such an academic made it up this monster-infested tower unscathed. He mentions the Septarians, a powerful ancient race lost 1200 years ago, and the legend that a Septarian named Oriole lays dormant somewhere within the world. Upon completion of all three tasks, they barely have time to celebrate when the mayor comes in, exclaiming he's been robbed by the septium he was preparing as the queen's gift. Investigating the crime scene, they're able to identify Josette as a likely suspect, so Shara joins them for this mission. Finding her hideout in the woods, it turns out Josette is actually a bandit from the Capua family. Estelle and Team Fine and suppress Josette's gang, succeeding in recovering the septium and are about to arrest the group when the bandit's airship opens covering fire, allowing the rogues to escape for now. Dismayed at the setback, Sherazard personally commends them on a job well done with the investigation and recovery despite being bracers in training, and formally imparts a recommendation from the Roland branch as a former junior bracer. It's explained to them that in order to be promoted to senior bracers, they must travel to every regional office in the kingdom and earn a recommendation, which is usually in recognition to a noteworthy achievement. There are four more regions to visit, so the road will be long. Their excitement for the future is interrupted as the phone rings, and the group learns the airliner their father was on disappeared mid-flight over the Bose region. Estelle has already made up her mind to go search for her father, so naturally Joshua follows, though with the army investigating the disappearance, all air traffic is cancelled, so they'll have to travel by foot. Sharon intends to go as well, so the three head west to Bose. As they travel, they hear repeat warning not to get too close to the army investigation site, but still make it to the commercial city safely. 
They learn more details that General Morgan, an old war hero that has no love for the Bracer Guild, is heading the investigation and is complicating things for the Bracer operations in the area. As it so happens, the Mayor of Bose has requested the Bracer Guild to conduct their own independent investigation, so after registering themselves to this branch, Estelle, Joshua, and Shara eagerly accept the task. Going to meet General Morgan first, they travel to the Erebonian Liberal Border Fort, hiding their identity as Bracers, but find they just missed him. Waiting for his return, they encounter a peculiar well-dressed man from Erebonia that somehow instantly knows their Bracers and seems to be more than a mere traveler. Later when meeting the General, he explains the investigation so far leads to the likelihood the missing airliner was hijacked, and in fact, a group called the Capua family has sent out a letter claiming ownership of the incident and demanding ransom. The Capua family are Sky Bandits, mainly operating in the Bose region, headed by three siblings, one of whom the party already tangled with. Unfortunately, Estelle lets slip that they're bracers, and an enraged General Morgan runs them out, harshly criticizing their deceptive tactics to get information out of him. Shara shoots back, pointing out the uncooperative nature of the army has led to no results or capture the Sky Pirates either. Their fight is broken up by the carefree man from the bar, who sings them both a song that actually ends up calming down everyone. He introduces himself as Olivier, and follows the group to Bose, where they report their findings and resume their search for the missing airliner. Following the lead, they pass by a gruff bracer named Agate, discover an abandoned mine, and finding their missing airliner hidden away in a quarry. Confronting Kyle of the Capua family, he drops that he was expecting the army at a later time, and after getting beaten in a fight, he drops a smokescreen and gets away yet again. Investigating the airliner left behind, they find the entire thing was cleaned out of cargo and passengers, likely already taken to the bandits' headquarters. Given that they're Sky Bandits, it seems strange they didn't take the entire ship with them, though they figure it likely means their true hideout is somewhere unique that can only accommodate their smaller aircraft. At this time, an army patrol with General Morgan in tow conveniently comes in right after them and accuses them of conspiring with the Sky Bandits, taking them all under arrest. In jail, Joshua remembers what Kyle said and how it likely means there is a mole in the army, and strangely enough, Olivier is also in jail with them in the adjacent cell. The Mayor of Bose helps them out after informing the General they are the children of Cassius Bright, for, as it turns out, Cassius long served with the General before he became a Bracer, and the two were good colleagues, though he still doesn't approve of the Bracer Guild. The Mayor arranges for Livier to be released as well, and in return, render aid to the group in the investigation of what is now a string of robberies in town. They encounter a courteous officer in black named Colonel Richard, who wishes for the army and Bracers to work together, and is currently leading the Royal Intelligence Division, also conducting their own investigations. Estelle and group follow clues and sightings until they find themselves tailing both Josette and Kyle into a meeting with a masked soldier who informs them about the army and Queen's movements and actions. Cher gets the idea to sabotage the airship the bandits came in on, though Olivier has an even better plan to stow away and let the bandits take them to their hideout. Within, the group causes havoc, knocking out grunts and securing the lost passengers, only to be shocked to see their father isn't among them. Rather, they learn Cassius disembarked the ship right before they lifted off, so he was never kidnapped to begin with, but it raises a new question of what he's doing and where. Meanwhile, the leader of the Capua family, Don, seems unusually ruthless to the other two siblings, insisting they kill the hostages once they get the ransom money. Estelle and group rush in, and both groups clash, with the Bracers easily winning. Don shakes his head and somehow has no knowledge of his actions since Josette left for Olent, and his personality change seems genuine. Taking its opportunity, Kyle once again drops a smoke bomb to escape, but it's for naught as Colonel Richard with General Morgan in tow are ready and waiting to capture them. Despite the glory of arrest stolen from them, their hard work of finding the base, subduing the gang, and rescuing the hostages is still recognized as the Mayor of Bose is overjoyed at the turn of events and Estelle and Joshua have earned their newest recommendation. The celebration is again cut short as a letter from Cassius comes in for them, written right before he got off the airliner, explaining his current mission will take some time, so don't expect him back until after the Queen's birthday. There's also a package addressed to Cassius from an unknown sender that they open up hoping for clues, but instead find a strange black orbment from somebody called K for the purpose of being delivered to Professor R. Olivier notes the black orbment may in fact be an artifact from ancient times given its unique build, but this one seems made recently. Joshua takes his time to recommend continuing traveling and earning senior bracership. After all, it beats sitting around waiting for their father and traveling may uncover more clues of his Professor R. The next day, the group splits up. As Joshua and Estelle continue their journey, Shara returns to Roland and Olivier continues his travels to Roland as well. On the airship back though, Shara overhears Olivier on a portable phone and learns he's actually a special operative of the Erebonian Empire here to actually meet with Cassius himself. Back with Estelle and Joshua, their next goal is the Ruan region, and as they hike the seaside route over there, they stop at a small village and run into a girl from the Royal Academy named Chloe, who's searching for a troublemaking orphan. Finding him and returning to the orphanage, it turns out Chloe is also a falconer and fencer, and after they all enjoy a meal together, she helps guide them to the port town of Ruan. The next day, they register with the local Bracer branch, and when requesting their first job, there's an alarming call to the branch requesting an investigation into a fire that burned down the local orphanage they were just at. 
Arriving on scene, the Matron and kids are okay, so they begin their investigation, learning that this was no accident. Agate arrives, doing his own jobs in town, and decides to take over the case, pulling rank and taking Estelle and Joshua off for the reason of their personal involvement with the orphanage, as well as dragging a civilian into things. Feeling bad for them, Chloe offers to enlist them instead for the job at her academy, helping out with a premiere play of their school festival. In preparation, Estelle and Joshua live among the students in the dorms and even attend classes as guests for a few days. As the starring roles, the trio put on a smash hit show, though there is a mysterious silver-haired man who stands in attendance. The play also garners a massive donation towards the rebuilding of the orphanage, but later that evening, someone steals the money, so Estelle and Joshua are on the case to find the culprit. Agate now comes in, sensing something in common with the arson case, and takes Estelle and Joshua with him as they hunt their shared culprit together. They follow clues until it leads them to the seaside lighthouse, taken over by a local gang, but the members all seem hypnotized and unusually stronger than normal. Climbing up, they learn that the orphanage was set fire maliciously and funds were stolen for the purpose of forcing the matron and kids to relocate while the mayor himself repurposes the land for high-value real estate. Strange Men in Black also reappear as hired help for the job by the mayor's aide, but Chloe and the party of bracers are able to best them, though they are forced back when the masked men turn on their employer and begin taking hostages. Aggie gives chase, though the mayor's aide and local gang are successfully arrested and the money recovered. The problem now is properly incriminating the mayor, and at this point, Chloe writes a quick letter to be delivered by her falcon. The Bracer Branch thinks to involve the Royal Army for this task, but they'll need Estelle and Joshua to buy them time with the mayor by pressing him for questions and exposing dirt on him. They visit the mayor's estate and walk in on him chatting with Duke Dunan about the plans for renovating the area, as Duke Dunan has his sights on being the next Crown King. They directly out the mayor being the mastermind of the arson and theft with the motive of amassing money to pay off a huge debt he already accumulated with speculative land deals and embezzlements. He lets loose some monsters to silence them, and when that fails, he pulls out a powerful artifact to try and freeze them in place. He's about to shoot them himself, when the artifact Estelle is carrying on her for Cassius suddenly lights up and cancels out the other artifact's effects. The mayor flees, and the group gives chase, dodging and deflecting the bullets he sends their way. As his yacht picks up speed, all hope of catching him seems lost, when suddenly a royal guard cruiser soars overhead and completely cuts off his escape. Upon capture, the mayor suddenly blanks out and cannot remember his crimes, just like with the leader of the Sky Bandits, though soon even Colonel Richard of the Royal Army arrives to congratulate them on their efforts, though he finds it so strange the Royal Guard arrived before they did so quickly. Wrapping up, they return to the guild where they learn Agate wasn't able to capture the men in black, but is still in pursuit. On the subject of the Black Orbman and their possession, the guild suggests going to Zeiss, a city famous for the manufacture of Orbmans for a clue, but before they leave, they award Estelle and Joshua their own recommendation for a high-stakes mission well done. With that, the Junior Bracers set their sight on Zeiss next and bid farewell to their friend Chloe, though she says she'll be in Gransel for the Queen's birthday in a month and hopes to meet up with them there. On the road again, Estelle and Joshua pass through a limestone cave en route to Zeiss, but pause to save a little girl in trouble in the caves. She actually holds her own in a fight with her own orbital guns, and introduces herself as Tita, a young engineer. They escort her back to the industrialized city and register themselves with the local guild, and are soon handed a referral to see the factory chief in regards to their strange black orbman. He can't make heads or tails of it, but suggests that Professor R was intended for is likely the famous Professor Russell, a legendary man who greatly advanced orbit technology over the last few decades and basically headed the orbital revolution in Liberal. While he has a workshop in town, the professor's granddaughter works for this very factory, and it turns out to be Tita herself. Taking them to Professor Russell, he is immediately intrigued by the item since it lacks any markings or opening, and even its casing is an unidentifiable metal. During testing, it activates and somehow shuts down all orbits downtown, adding even more intrigue to its true nature. As he works on it, the group takes Tita for some downtime at a hot springs resort nearby while working a small job, and it comes to light again for Estelle how much people perceive her and Joshua as a romantic item. On the way back, they hear of a gas leak accident in the factory with Professor Russell still inside, so they hurry in, running into Agate, who's also looking into the matter. It turns out Masked Men in Black are behind the incident again, and this time caught in the middle of kidnapping the Professor and the Black Orbman. They manage to get away in plain sight, disguised as Royal Guardsmen, and the group loses the trail as well as the Professor. Soon after, the Royal Intelligence Division comes in, filing the entire ordeal as terrorism and starting their own internal investigation. They conveniently run into Professor Alba again, who reports he saw some suspicious people dressed as guardsmen in the local ruins he was researching himself, so the party now has a firm lead. As they climb yet another ancient tower, Agate also notes these guys are somehow able to train and command monsters in a way he's never seen before. Confronting the Men in Black again, they don't spot the Red Mask leader among them, so they clean up the rest. The tide turns against them when the assailants pull out their own airship, and Agate saves Tita, who blew their window to get the Professor, and results in the kidnappers getting away again and Agate being poisoned. 
They run into a large traveler from the east named Zane who offers to help move Agate, as it turns out he too is a bracer from the neighboring Republic of Calvert. He's on his way to Gransel, but chooses to accompany them retrieving an antidote herb from within a dangerous monster den. With Agate out of danger, Zane continues on his trip, and the rest of the group learns the airship the men in Black God away in was caught on film right above a royal army installation. Though the matter should be handled delicately, they provoke a response by going to the fortress in the picture and asking some questions, only to find the soldiers in the base acting very shifty. To clinch things, they see the same horrible shutdown phenomenon affect the base like they saw before, meaning for some reason, the professor is being held captive here in this royal army fort. When they return to the guild, Agate is back on his feet and raring to go sneak into the fort and break out the professor, but there's a major problem. There is an explicit non-intervention clause between the Bracer Guild and Royal Army, in which Bracers have no sovereignty in regards to national figures or military, so they couldn't arrest a politician or anyone in the army even if they witness a crime. However, there is a loophole. As the Bracers are an organization of the people for the people, they may intervene to protect civilians, and since the professor is a civilian, they may accept a request to rescue just him. The Factory Chief is more than willing to support, so Estelle, Joshua, and Agate are deployed on this rescue mission. Thanks to Tita's tech support, they're able to infiltrate at night and confirm the Men in Black are likely special covert ops units in the military. Sneaking around, they're surprised to find Colonel Richard is actually the one behind everything, including holding the Professor and stealing the Black Orbment, which he calls the Gospel. After he leaves the base, the group is quick to knock out some guards and rescue the Professor, but the alarm rings out, so escape is now more of a challenge. Major Sid of the base sneaks them away, exposing that Colonel Richard has the Royal Armed Forces under his thumb with the Intelligence Division, and has even imprisoned the imposing General Morgan. Richard is currently taking advantage of the weakness in the infrastructure of the military, as well as common corruption, and now moves to frame the Imperial Guardsmen for treason on false charges. Sid can't do much to help that, but will help them escape for now, leading them out with a secret passageway. Agate now moves to hide the Professor and Tita somewhere else safely, as the army knows his face very well, but not so much Estelle's and Joshua's. The Professor now reveals the Gospel originally came from the Intelligence Division, was stolen from them, and they found it again when the Professor caused a blackout with it earlier, hence the kidnapping. He wants them now to take the Gospel, go to the Queen in Gransel, and warn her personally of Colonel Richard's plot. Parting ways, the two groups now head off on their own, while at the same time, we see a Royal Guardsman escaping with Chloe, and now holding off Men in Black while Chloe hurries to Gransel, but even her escape is cut off by Colonel Richard himself. Back in town, Estelle and Joshua are preparing to embark for Gransel, but before that, for the exceptional feat of breaking the Professor out of a secure military compound, they are awarded their own recommendation from this branch. On the road again, they hear about a fighting tournament, but are about to be detained by the army as all bracers are currently under suspicion. Conveniently again, Professor Alba happens to be here and covers for them, in return for helping him out earlier. Making it to the capital city of Gransel, they register with the branch and get right into business, as the branch itself still has no news on Cassius' whereabouts, and pressure from Colonel Richard means getting to the Queen won't be straightforward. Pretending to be Taurus, they approach the castle and learn that the Queen is purportedly ill and the Royal Guardsmen have been removed, and while Duke Dunan is next in line to be King, he's so unreliable that all administration has been performed by Colonel Richard instead. With no way to get inside for now, they decide to sit in on the fighting tournament, observing that their friend Zane is participating as well. Duke Dunan personally announces among the prizes for the winner will be an invitation to a royal banquet in three days in Gransel Castle, so suddenly Joshua and Estelle see a way to get the professor's message through. As events play along, the other bracers suggest Estelle and Joshua join Zane in the team competition for the grand prize, and they agree. Zane allows them along, but when wondering who can be their fourth slot member, Olivier happens to enter the scene, eager to oblige and conveniently wishing to enter the castle as well. That night, Estelle finds herself once more self-aware of herself and her growing feelings towards Joshua, though she still needs time to sort her thoughts out. They investigate a little on their targets, learning that Colonel Richard used to serve under Cassius when Cassius used to be a colonel in the army, and the masked man in red is Lawrence, a part of the hunting corps, or Jaegers, an elite mercenary group. To himself, Joshua seems familiar with the Jester division of the Jaegers that Lawrence is from. That night, they receive a strange letter to meet at night in the cathedral, and cautiously following it, they find it belongs to Lieutenant Julia, the royal guardsman who helped stop the corrupt mayor and also has been helping Chloe. She hands them a letter to also give to the Queen, as herself and the other royal guards are hiding in the church as the intelligence division hunts them down. As a return back to their room, Joshua thinks and then makes a serious promise to Estelle that when this ordeal is over, he'll tell her about his past before they met, something he has never done all these years. As they make it to the finals, their opponent is none other than Lawrence with his special ops team, though Joshua suspects he's seen Lawrence's sword play before, and the Bracers are able to edge out a tough victory. Colonel Richard notes the turn of events and how Lawrence was holding back this entire time, but doesn't believe the Bracers are capable of impacting their plan that's already nearing completion. With the invitation and plan, Estelle, Joshua, and Zane enter the castle and are impressed by the scale of it all. 
They note the Tai's security prevalent in the castle, but seek out the head maid, as Julia had advised, who reads Julia's letters and thinks of a way to have them meet the Queen. That night, Colonel Richard makes the announcement that the Queen intends to abdicate the throne to Duke Dunan in a few days, and will make the formal announcement herself during her birthday celebration, much to the disbelief of everyone there. The Dean of the Royal Academy points out that Princess Claudia also has an equal standing to claim the throne, but Colonel Richard claims the Queen deemed her too young to accept the crown. After dinner, the head maid has Estelle and Joshua dress up as maids in order to sneak them next to the Queen, and the two of them finally get to meet Queen Alicia face to face. She listens to their message from Professor Russell, and shares that some time ago there was a strange orbital reaction from deep underground Gransel that the Professor privately investigated, yet Colonel Richard should never have learned of. She knows their father Cassius personally, as he was a friend to her late son, and played a pivotal role in the war as well as helping her with missions from time to time even today. Evidently, he was the officer who planned a successful counteroffensive against the Erebonians when they were completely surrounded and outnumbered. Unfortunately, Estelle's mother was a casualty of the war when she sacrificed herself to save Estelle from a destroyed clock tower and relent during the fighting, which shook Cassius so hard he retired from the military and instead became a bracer to be closer to home. Bringing things to the present, she asks them to rescue those who were captured by the Intelligence Division, especially Princess Claudia, whom she originally backed as a successor to the throne, which is really what started the coup d'etat plot by Colonel Richard to begin with. Viewing the current and potential leadership as weak, Colonel Richard would use Duke Dunan as a puppet and instead steal a burl into a strong militarization and become more of an international presence. Returning to their room, Zane is interested in helping out, as it turns out he was sent here originally by Cassius, and was even asked to help Estelle and Joshua out should they need it. In fact, Zane is an A-ranked bracer, one of only 20 in the world, though Cassius is one of the only four informal S-ranks, dubbed the Divine Blade. Given the escalation of this mission, backup would be preferred, but with the martial law set in blocking almost all travel, they can't get help from the other branches in time, so they must instead gather the talents they have here. Assembling the other bracers from the tournament, as well as Julia and the Hiding Guardsmen, they plan a rescue with two teams, a decoy team and a rescue team, and plan to take the villa with the hostages in it by force. Estelle, Joshua, and Zane are to play the critical role as the core rescue team, and united, the Queen's Liberation Front storm the castle at night. Cutting past dozens of Special Ops soldiers, Estelle and team locate the room where the VIP hostages are being held, and are shocked to find that Princess Claudia is in fact their friend Chloe. When the guards get desperate and start threatening hostages, backup comes just in time as Sherazard and Olivier dash in to save them. Hostages rescued, and most of the special ops on the grounds defeated, and Colonel Richard elsewhere, the window to escape is open, but Chloe points out the window to save the Queen is open too. She formally requests the bracers there to help her in this, and produces an old map of the castle with some forgotten routes they can use to infiltrate. For rescuing the Queen, the plan is for Joshua, Olivier, and Zane to infiltrate the sewers and open the castle gates for the ground forces, who will lead the standing guard away for Estelle, Sharon, and Chloe to fly in on an airship and break into the Queen's room directly. Succeeding on his end, Team Joshua gets the gates open, and Lieutenant Julia wastes no time rushing the breach alongside the local bracers and royal guards. Dropping in, Team Estelle confronts Colonel Richard's second-in-command, blow past her, and next confront the would-be cowardly King Duke Dunan. Once his guards are defeated, he is quick to give up, but beyond him, Lieutenant Lauren stands between them and the Queen. He unveils his face to be the same silver-haired man who observed the school play in Ruan, and even outnumbered 3 to 1, he is hardly outmatched, as he easily defeats the three girls. However, he strangely chooses to not only surrender the Queen back to them, but advises they hurry below if they are to stop Colonel Richard, as he makes a complete escape. Confused at Richard's intentions, the Queen focuses all of them when Team Joshua now runs in, and that is that Colonel Richard is after Oriole, the Shining Ring, and one of the powerful Septarians. At this time, Agate, Tita, and Professor Russell now come in, and together everyone descends to the forbidden depths below the castle. Given the span of the Zamurian ruins, the group has a forward team and a standby base team ready, with Estelle and Joshua leading the advance. Delving in, they fight past ancient machines and the remnants of Colonel Richard's rebellion until they encounter the Colonel himself. He calmly explains his plan was to wield the ancient almighty power of the Septarians and use it to give Liberal the power it needs to stand above its neighboring countries. Liberal succeeded in independence so far because Cassius won the war 10 years ago, and the technological advantage gave them an edge. However, since then, the other countries have advanced their science, and Cassius left the military, so Liberal is vulnerable again. He does this out of love for the country, but Estelle challenges that relying on some alien weapon and ruling by fear isn't the way, and instead the best asset Liberal has is its people willing to band together and protect the country. After all, Cassius was just one man and didn't win the war by himself. Joshua notes it's awfully suspicious that Colonel Richard conveniently learned of this forbidden tech, the means to reach it, and how to control the Black Orbit, even though no one, even the Queen, knew for decades. 
If anything, this sounds just like the mind-controlling phenomenon they saw with the Capua family and the corrupt mayor, but Colonel Richards denies any hypnotic brainwashing and attacks them personally. Clashing with a former subordinate of the war hero father, they succeed in taking him down, but after doing so, the Black Orbman activates, and soon the facility around them begins activating a new protocol to unseal Oriole. A giant security robot comes out to deal with them, and while they beat its first form, the bracers are beaten down by its upgraded mode. Colonel Richards somehow snaps to and realizes his plan is a farce, and now aids the group, trying to buy them time to escape, and is willing to sacrifice himself to atone for his mistake. However, out of the blue, Cassius himself dashes in to strike down the robot, giving the group a second win to destroy it once and for all. With the dust settled, Colonel Richard explains his motivations to Cassius, asking why he left the country with no hope, and Cassius punches some sense into him, explaining he left because the country had such great unity and leaders with it, like Richard and General Morgan. He never wanted people to have his delusional hero worship of him, and instead advises him to not run away like he did from protecting the most important things in life. With that, the Intelligence Division's staged coup d'etat was defeated. After guilty parties are found and arrested, the army comes in to keep the peace, though in the meanwhile, Estelle and Joshua earn their final recommendation, need to become promoted to full-fledged bracers. Awarded their new badges of office by their own father, the news now comes out that Cassius is also stepping down as a bracer and resuming active duty in the army. Due to the internal damage caused by the Intelligence Division, he felt it necessary to come in and quell the chaos and rebuild structure. After all, there are loyal special ops still on the run, Richard's second-in-command still hasn't been caught, and the real issue is what the effect of breaking the seal in Oriole will bring in the future. Not to mention, there is still the mystery of the brainwashings and the Black Orbit, which was apparently delivered to Richard by Lawrence. Estelle describes Lawrence's true face to them, and Joshua seems stricken by surprise. Taking time now to enjoy the festival, Estelle seems eager to confess her newfound feelings to Joshua, but is terribly clumsy at it. During a break, Professor Alba conveniently greets Joshua, and Joshua directly confronts Alba on the fact that he's always been nearby, or conveniently investigating every strange incident of brainwashing or hypnotism since they first met him in the ruins, and has always had the strangest timing with the most dangerous locations to boot. Joshua then directly asks if he's really the mastermind behind all this, and suddenly Alba's demeanor changes. He openly admits it, and with a snap of his fingers gives back all of Joshua's memories. In the shock at the sudden rush, Joshua is stunned that Alba has the power to twist minds so easily, and with his restored mind, recognizes Alba to be one of the Seven Snake Apostles, Weissman the Faceless. Weissman smirks, acknowledging Joshua by his true name and title, the Black Fang, an enforcer part of Legion 13. Weissman now explains he took this time to simply say hello, since the first part of his plan, opening the gate and undoing the seal, went off perfectly. In fact, he informs Joshua he's releasing him from the spy work he's unknowingly been doing for them for the past five years, reporting bracer business and movement, and especially any intel on Cassius. Weissman molded Joshua into a human weapon, and wonders how he'll live his decent life going forward, knowing he's really a monster inside, and says he's free to join his organization Ouroboros again. As the game ends, Knight arrives, and Estelle admits to Shara she's fallen for Joshua, which is to the surprise of nobody. She ventures out and spots Joshua thinking to himself, and as she approaches, he confesses he's ready to tell her what he's been doing before they met. He reveals he lived a normal life until a terrible tragedy struck that broke his heart and he languished, until one day a man came by who offered to heal his heart and instead transformed Joshua's empty heart into that of a murderer. For years he killed every day, becoming more and more ruthless and skilled, until he was assigned to target Cassius. However, Cassius was too good and easily beat Joshua, and when other assassins moved to kill Joshua as a loose end, Cassius rescued Joshua and decided to show mercy and take him into his home. He admits the rest of the five years have been like a dream to him, and grimly admits all dreams must come to an end. Estelle bursts out that his past might be hard for her to believe, but their time spent together was real. She loudly confesses her love for him, looks past his bloody history, and urges him to stay with her. In response, Joshua steps in and kisses Estelle, slips a sleeping pill into her mouth, and as she gently falls, he claims he can't have her see the truly ugly side of him and what he must now do. Before she falls asleep under the starry sky, Joshua confesses his love for her since the day they met, and tells her goodbye. The next day, Joshua is already gone, but Estelle hasn't given up, packing her bags and optimistically moving forward on her new journey of bringing Joshua home as this first chapter comes to a close. The Legend of Heroes Trails in the Sky first chapter has enjoyed the success of selling over 500,000 copies worldwide. This recapitation was chosen by Brian. Thanks a lot for supporting the show as a patron, I really appreciate it. If you would like to support the show yourself, please follow the Patreon link in the description below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next battlefield.